I now have the pleasure of introducing Francesca, who is a senior researcher and consultant with Baker Richards. And she's going to deliver the keynote presentation this morning. And it, the title of that is Priceless, How to Sell More and Make More Income. Francesca, welcome. Hello everyone, uh, thank you very much for uh, having me here today. Uh, some of you might have uh, expected Debbie Richards to be here this morning. Uh, she's the one of the founders and principals of Baker Richards and uh, fortunately she has suffered an injury last week so she couldn't be here with you today uh, and uh, she was really sorry about that but um, uh, hopefully uh, I'll make her proud. <laughs> Excuse me, we can't hear you at the back. Oh, can't hear me at the back. Should I just pick up? How about now? Not really. Is it on at all? Yeah. How about now? Yes. Yes. Great. So um, I'm truly delighted to be here this morning to uh, share a little bit of our experience and our work uh, with organizations around the world um, to um, help them uh, achieve their commercial potential. Uh, a little bit about us. Uh, we are a consulting and uh, software firm. Uh, we, our mission is uh, to help organizations achieve their commercial potential. And we work in areas including pricing, um, in one way term, um, affiliation, admissions, uh, inc that includes memberships, annual passes and donations and so on. We work on customer segmentation. Uh, we have been um, doing this since 2003, yes. Uh, and uh, these are just some of the organizations we've worked uh, with um, over the years. We are um, we have uh, worked on uh, over 500 projects worldwide by now, um, and we are really proud to have delivered uh, no less than 200% return on investment for our clients on evaluated projects. Um, and that gives us uh, the opportunity to help these organizations make impact uh, and positive impact on, uh, on, on in the cultural sector. Um, so I've been asked to talk today um, about increasing sales and income, which is a huge subject and uh, uh, something that I'll be happy to talk all day about. But um, I'm hoping to share some key insights this morning and offer a few key takeaways for, uh, for, uh, for us to discuss. So first of all, why pricing? Well, you are going to discover today that I get uh, quite geeky about pricing and very quite passionate about pricing. We all do really at Baker Richards. And the reason that we get so uh, enthusiastic about pricing strategies is that you can design a strategy that um, um, helps you meet a wide range of objectives. You can make that those could be making more income as well as making more sales and uh, being more accessible and so on. It really a pricing strategy that's well designed really helps you achieve uh, whatever you want to achieve. And you um, in in the sector, um, in, it, you can of course choose amongst a, a, a huge variety of variables to make your pricing strategy work. And I will talk about uh, that uh, in more detail. And you having a pricing strategy that works also also means that you um, adjusting these details uh, can add up to significant gains. And even if uh, for um, you're working with a very with very tight margins. Um, even if we uh, manage to increase your income by three, four, five percent, that's that's without losing sales. That's an all additional income that hits the bottom line really. Uh, so if you've got your pricing strategy in place, uh, then you can look at revenue management to uh, as a way of multiplying those gains and making them sort of embedded in your in your thinking. <laughs> And I'll, I'll talk about revenue management in a bit more detail uh, later on. And finally, one reason that I get um, really enthusiastic about that, uh, about talking about pricing, is that it's not um, just quite like a marketing campaign where you have to run that over and over. The changes that you make to your pricing strategy are usually structural, so they continue to deliver impact also um, uh, later on in a structural way. So. We can't really talk about prices without talking about value, and that's uh, that will lead me to my first uh, my first point. 
I wanted to uh, start with a with a um, sort of a silly story. Really, um, I'm I am I am Italian, and uh, all of my most most of my family lives in Italy, and I was there uh, to visit my family uh, a few um, over the holidays, and uh, I, I went um, I went grocery shopping with my mom. Went to the supermarket, and my mom is now um, at an age where. Um, she starts thinking about uh, her health, and uh, she's also um, a, a doctor. She is, she's the equivalent of a GP in, in Italy. And uh, you know how they say that doctors make the worst patients? So she doesn't really, she starts thinking about health and how to take care of that. So we are grocery shopping, we are in the supermarket, and we stop, um, she stops at, in, in uh, the sort of the, the, the fridge aisle, and she sees a wonderful product, which is, I think, is the equivalent of a Bobenicol is in the UK. So it's a basically margarine that um, supposedly um, lowers your cholesterol. And so she says, "Well, you know, maybe I should be <laughs> talking. I should be thinking about this kind of stuff. Uh, my friends certainly are. Um, so maybe I could purchase this product, and that will help me take care of my health. Except that that type of margarine." cost like the equivalent of about four pounds um, and she was like well, I'm not surely I'm not buying tub of margarine for four pounds so that she puts it back on the shelf and we continue our our, um, our our tour until we get to our favorite aisle which is the wine aisle and uh, we get and it, it so happens that there is a special bottle is a, a bottle of Montepulciano da Bruzzo a special <coughs> offer and that's about uh, four pounds as well, so the equivalent of about four pounds. <coughs> and in addition to the, that's a great offer in, in, in itself, but also uh, my hometown is in Abruzzo, which is the region that makes Montepulciano, so it's quite a big deal. And um, surely, you know, if you've got a bottle of Montepulciano for four pounds, you just, you, you get it. <laughs> so she, that goes straight into the, 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 the shopping trolley and uh, she's quite happy with the purchase. So the point of this very silly story is that it's not about the four pounds, it's not about the pounds, the, the, the number four, it's about the value that we associate with um, the price that we've been asked to pay as customers. So um, if, if that price, so clearly for the top of margarine that the value didn't quite correspond to the value, that we, to the price that was being asked to pay, for a bottom multiple channel, yeah, it, it does. And uh, well, of course, that <laughs> I think we, we all want to believe that uh, red wine lowers your cholesterol as well. So that you were, I think we are, she was quite happy with her purchase. Um, so the point about this, the, this, 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 this story, this takeaway, is that price doesn't really operate in isolation. So you don't really want to think about price without thinking about value as well. So someone would only really buy something if they believe that the price is balanced with the value that is being offered. And in many, many organizations that we work with, and even as a, as a, as a customer, as a consumer myself, we very much find that the conversation really focuses on the, on the price side of the scale. And it's very difficult that to, to think about uh, uh, the value side of the scale. So before thinking about price, about uh, pricing in general, we need to think about the, the value that we're offering. So about, um, I think it was about 15 years ago, so quite a long time ago, before my time at Baker Richards, um, uh, Debbie and Tim uh, Baker Richards worked uh, with the um, Young Vic Theatre in London, if anyone's familiar. And at that time, the Young Vic was fam famously single priced. So they charge one price for all the seats in an auditorium like this one. Um, there were two reasons for doing that, for charging one price. One was because they it were a small uh, venue, they wanted to keep things simple. But at the same, they also wanted, it also sort of mm, uh, worked with their philosophy. So they, they, they said, we don't want to be the kind of theater where the rich people sit at the front, the poor people and the students sit at the back. We, that, doesn't, that doesn't work for us. So the problem with that approach, uh, and uh, we discovered working with them, was that it's, 
to to have uh, to have the one single price and to uh, to have that um, that structure in place, the price that they had to charge was uh, about was ni nineteen pounds fifty for a ticket, which very, it doesn't sound like a, a huge lot today, but fifteen years ago, um, it it was it was a, a, a relatively big deal. So, in that in that situation, what the um, not, with this nice chart, which is the uh, um, the price elasticity of demand curve, what these what the problem the problem with this situation is what the, the curve tells us that charging one price is the one way to um, lose sales and lose income. So because they uh, they were charging that one single price and that they were selling uh, at a given capacity, that's the uh, the area of their rectangular is how much money they make. If they had they charged something like um, maybe I don't know twenty five pounds, so something for some seats they charge some. If they charge something a little bit higher, they maybe the, um, some captain of industries in London would have happily paid that, and that would have been extra sales as well as extra income. But at the same time, if, if they were not selling out, so even if they if they uh, also, in addition to that, pay uh, charge a lower price, maybe um, ten pounds or fifteen pounds. That would have um, allowed them to make uh, extra sales and extra income as well, because even though they had uh, discounts and concessions for students and young people and so on, um, they we we had Debbie and David uh, Debbie and Tim had to point out to them that even some members of their box office team couldn't really afford. To go to their own theater uh, without because they didn't qualify for a concession, so nine and uh, nineteen uh, pound fifty for two people is like almost you know was almost forty pounds and um, not everyone can afford that on a regular basis. So, it if there's one thing that you take away from uh, this this presentation and this and and and, and this um, discussion is that it is inherently beneficial. We find. To charge, um, to to have different prices for people to choose from. So, this is what the e economists tell us, and uh, it's displayed in the in the curve. Uh, but in addition to that, uh, we we find that also consumer psychology tells us that. So that's the way. That's a. a, a it helps us understand how um, consumers think in a, from in, in from a psychological perspective in terms of making their purchase, and that we find w when we look at it from the from the uh, organization side works in a way in a certain way, but when we are actually consumers ourselves, it actually works in exactly the same way. The main point about uh, one of the key points about the uh, a consumer psychology approach to um, to this discussion is that human beings are really quite incredibly bad at assessing things in isolation. So for example, if I gave you a bag of flour and I asked you uh, to uh, say how much it weighs, you find it quite difficult to say um, it weighs one kilo or something like that. But if I gave you another bag of, flag, uh, of flour and I told you that it's that's one kilo, then you'd, you'd find it quite, uh, quite uh, sort of easier to um, to to say what's the weight uh, the weight of the first bag because you're now able to assess the two things um, uh, against each other and to weigh things up against each other. So this this process of uh, weigh, weighing things up and comparing things uh, to each other is what causes this uh, classical optical illusion to work. It's just, again a really silly example, but I can promise you because I've spent time I've done the slides and I've spent time measuring it. The, the two uh, red dots are the same size. It doesn't quite look like that way, but the reason why it doesn't look that way is because our brain assesses, th assesses, assesses things in, in, um, in, in comparison to other things. So because the, because the, one, the dot on the right-hand side is, is assessed against um, smaller blue dots, that looks bigger. So in terms of, um, uh, it, 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 it's, it's much difficult. It's much more difficult for our brain to process things um, by themselves, and their perception changes when they're compared to other things. We have done um, on this on this point. We've done some work um, with um, minor entertainment, minor entertainment company, which um, 
was touring, uh, and maybe you, you, you will have heard about it, was, and he actually is still touring with their um, In the Night Garden live show, which is based on the uh, BBC's children's show, TV, TV show. And what they, um, there, I think this is a great example of how this, this, this principle works, because when they went out on the road with their tour of their show, and uh, they um, were selling balloons, um, to uh, children and families uh, coming to see their show. Those balloons were a price of four pounds. <coughs> Again, I guess four pounds is a recurring uh, theme today. So what they had quite a big problem with the four pound balloons because um, they got lots of complaints. It's just too expensive for a balloon. I will pay the price for the ticket. I've brought my family here. I don't want to pay four pounds for a balloon. And what most organizations that we know uh, would do in the face of complaints about something being, being expensive is they would, they would really put the price down. So you've got complaints, too expensive, let's make it less expensive. But what they did, and I think that's really interesting, was they introduced the eight pound balloon. <laughs> Interestingly, there were no more complaints about the four pound balloon because that became cheaper by comparison. So like very much like the bag of flour, is pe people were no longer judging the four pound balloon in isolation. They were comparing it to the eight pound balloon and that, does, that doesn't look that bad um, after all. So interestingly, interestingly not only there were, was there a reduction in the complaints about the four pounds balloon, but actually the number of, of four pound balloons that they sold was in, had increased um, when they introduced the more expensive one. So by offering people multiple options and the ability, and then crucially the ability to compare them, so to have them readily available there so that people can make their judgment, they sold a lot more balloons and then, um, and then it clearly brought more income in. So I guess one a question uh, back to um, uh, s some of you who run their own um, uh, business and their own organization would be: Is uh, can you think of ways to make um, to to give people more options to compare? Uh, maybe that's not easy for for all organizations, but that that I think that um, these examples are some show that um, there are some benefits to it. So, in terms of prices. We, uh, we, I said, we. It, it's inherently beneficial to have a range of prices to, for people to choose from, and that's great. You can come up. We, we can all come up with different prices, and that's already quite an, an interesting and difficult pro, uh, process to come up with prices. But actually, that what the prices, what the price should be, is not necessarily the only, uh, neither the the most interesting question of all, and. It's actually, uh, this is what we call a, a pricing toolbox. There are many other questions that you want to address when coming up with your pricing strategy. You want to think about, of course, what the prices should be, what's the range and relationships between the prices, because as, as we said, it, the, uh, because people assess things uh, by comparison, we, you want to make those range and relationships and gaps between prices such that um, it, it communicates the behavior that you want, to com you want people to do. To undertake, you want you might, how many prices do you, should you have? You, and we know we should you should have more than one, but um, should you have two, three, four, five? Uh, how many uh, units at each price should you sell? Um, what is the relationship to price price threshold? So a price threshold will be, for example, ten pounds. Some if you price something like nine nine ninety nine or ten pounds and one, uh, that's that's that <coughs> place with the threshold of ten pounds. Uh, should you should you have discounting uh, promotions and um, what what's the value what the value of those discounting uh, of those discounts should be and if anything should you have any fees or surcharges on top of that so there's many different questions that go beyond what should the price be for my um, for the organizations or for the service that I'm offering so it is. If, if we accept that it's beneficial to have uh, a range of prices for people to choose from, um, you, the prices should be um, done in a way that there are value fences that justify the differences in prices. So we call them value fences. So these are differences in value that justify the differences in price. 
clearly there's no point um, charging different prices and people would, would not sort of um, understand why you're charging different prices if you don't if you don't follow up with this is the reason why I'm, I'm charging different prices and those could be a whole lot of different things those could be uh, inventory value fences so the inventory are the, the different aspects of um, of the core offer of the service or, or facility that you're offering for example um, maybe some attractions I have a house, a house and a garden or an exhibition space so uh, you might think of whether you want to charge separately for each uh, item of your inventory or you want to bundle them up together um, you can um, uh, think about charging differently as maybe um, some of, uh, of you already do in terms of seasonality peak time versus off peak um, you can uh, charge differently in terms of added value. So, for example, if you're offering uh, a, a premium or an, an extra value, um, you can uh, consider charging differently for those. Um, if you are charging um, on, for food and beverages separately or for, for as a bundle together. Um, you can think about um, having value fences along the dimension of customer behavior. So you might charge differently if people, uh, if for example, if you invite pe uh, customers to uh, attend more frequently, if you if you invite them to attend in groups um, of bigger party size, uh, for example, for online booking or different sales channels. Um, quite crucially, I think for weather dependent uh, um, services or attraction, you might want to uh, differentiate prices based on time of booking. So if for uh, you might want to incentivize advan advanced booking or early booking, and there are, you, you can use prices to do that so that you sort of have, have a um, fixed uh, sort of chunk of sales that um, are guaranteed for your um, off-peak uh, times. And of course, you will want to think about the demographics. So if you want to uh, price differently for families or for seniors or for students or young people. So because I just mentioned um, uh, potentially discounting uh, and price or pricing differently for families and young people and that often comes in the form of a discount. Um, I just wanted to touch a bit on that because discounting and uh, as consumers we know might be can, can be a quite a powerful um, sales promotion tool. So it works we see that discounting appeals more than a lower price does because it suggests that you get more value for less. That, I don't think that's rocket science. I think as consumers, we all have a perception of that. Of course, if you uh, charge 10, 10 pounds for 20 pound tickets or 100 pound for 200 pound um, hotel stay, that's better than charging 10 pound or 150 pound uh, straight away because that um, creates the, the, the perception in the customer that what they're paying for is is of, of a higher value really and that's um uh, that has a name uh, so someone went on and and called it price quality effect so where uh, that that happens when from a consumer psychology point of view uh when we use price as a proxy for the value uh that that we we hope to get from that price equally of course well you can you can charge you can adjust discounting in different ways you can uh, clearly change the discount rate you can get it 5%, 10%, and so on. You can change, uh, you can vary it uh, based on the applicability. So it, either if, what it applies to, for example, just on your um, matinees um, tours, or uh, sorry, your morning tours, or your matinee for the theater, uh, whether it, you can control their availability. So sometimes you, we find in brochures or in, uh, in guides, you see uh, that discounts are subject to availability. You can use quotas to, 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 to sort of cap that, that discounting. Uh, and of course, you can allocate different discounts and different quotas based on your um, uh, seasonality or, or your your uh, demand pattern. Of course, that that's the, you're you're in the best position to know that. And, oop, sorry. Um, in terms, well, I just want to make one last point on this on discounting. Um, the most important thing uh, thing we find is that um, indiscriminate discounting is the worst thing. So it, offering discounts and offering um, giving money away uh, just for the sake of, uh, of of doing that doesn't really without a, a strategy or a plan doesn't really work because what it does it plays on the price quality effect and it undermines crucially the value of what you're offering. It can bring you more sales. It can bring you more people. 
um, if you if if it's if it's done right. Discounting are a part of of pricing strategy, are part of revenue management strategies, but. Um, Turns out that um, we had a lot of thought about how to how do you increase your sales, and so how do you bring more people in your uh, t to your organization or to your attraction or to your hotel. And this morning we uh, briefly someone um, talked about um, that uh, the fact that we wanted to, that you wanted to um, uh, attract new uh, booker new bookers new people new customers that haven't been to the Isle, to the Isle of Man before. And that's one strategy. So to get to increase your sales, you can you can play an acquisition and you get more uh, new customers. But there are actually only four other ways of in, of getting more people, therefore increasing your sales. The second one, first one is acquisition. Second one is reactivation. So get so people who have been before, they just then went went away, didn't come back. Those are lapsed customers that you might want to reactivate, and uh, you may want to come back. You can work on retain the ones that uh, that come back year on year. So we had an example of someone uh, before of um, uh, customers coming back every year. That's that working on their retention and making sure that their experience um, is 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 up to high standards. That's a retention strategy, and uh, it's actually easier in a way of uh, than getting new customers altogether because you have to work much much harder to get new ones. You can get though the ex your existing customers to come um, to, to attend a little bit more frequently, maybe even just once more. And we find in in many theaters and many uh, performing arts organizations, um, people get quite scared by the number of onceers we call them. So people only ever attend once uh, that they have. And if we all, all if we all think about our experience as consumers of in a in for a visitor attraction or a, in a cultural. Um, for into a cultural organization, we think maybe we like to think of ourselves so as right, very uh, you know uh, strong cultural culture consumers. But maybe if we actually think about uh, many times how many times in the past year we've been to a theater or to a visitor attraction, then you think well maybe I actually have been once, but I am I am a, a consumer of the arts or a consumer or I'm a, I'm a frequent traveler for example. So and the fifth one is party size. So get get customers get. Uh, your existing customers to bring friends, families, uh, extended families, and uh, and so on. Um, thinking about uh, so kind of bringing together the point of discounting and uh, strategies for um, um, having so for increasing sales. Uh, specifically, I think this relates to the reactivation point. Um, a few years ago, we've done some work with. Um, uh, University Musical Society, which is based in the U.S. at the University of Michigan, quite sounds quite quite far, quite far, but it was actually quite. Um, I think the principle is applicable everywhere else. Everywhere else, what they wanted to do is uh, they wanted to reactivate the um, their lapsed bookers, so the people who attended before they were on their mailing list, but they they haven't made an attendance in in, in quite a while. And well, that, gi that gave us a chance to do a little experiment uh, in uh, consumer psychology. So uh, we looked at their uh, lapse ticket buyers from uh, a given season. And we, t we tried different, different um, sort of reactivation techniques. First of all, they, they selected a sample of lapsed con customers that they had on, a, on their mailing list. To the to the to a group of people, uh, which was the control group, they sent a letter in the post and said, um, "We are we have these new amazing um, concerts and shows. Please come back. Uh, we would love to see you again." Then to another group, they sent um, a come back um, discount of for the value of twenty pounds. They said in this letter, they said, "If you when you come back for an event in the next season, we'll be uh, delighted to offer you a discount." Uh, worth twenty twenty dollars. Sorry, uh, and finally to a third group, they gave um, a voucher, a cash voucher, we, and we see lots of them um, in in also in, in different circumstances. So that voucher was worth the same, was worth twenty dollars, um, with some restrictions, of course. Uh, and the letter said, uh, "Here's a, a voucher uh, worth twenty dollars for your next purchase with us for our next season. We would love to 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 see you to have you back." And um, oh, here's the voucher actually. 
uh, yes, some as I said, some restrictions applied. So um, clearly, it wasn't just any any purchase. So if there were, um, I think, a minimum spend, yes, and it, it clearly was a limited time offer. And of course, it was quite important that um, so because it was sent by email, um, clearly that has um, a cost. Uh, we we've, we've seen today that different uh, medium me, media for for marketing have different costs. So they decided to invest. In this experiment, um, even though that clearly has um, as uh, as this whole budgeting process behind, I I don't know if you already uh, sort of uh, imagine what the results will be. The results were that the control group, uh, a certain proportion, um, actually made a purchase in this in the in the subsequent season. We are talking about lapsed subscribers, lapsed uh, bookers. So they, clearly, the percentages are not huge because we're really think, talking about people that were were gone. So in terms of uh, the actual numbers, um, that that's something to bear in mind. But in terms of comparing how the different uh, groups did, how the different offers uh, did, you can clearly see how the the voucher um, letter did much much better than the other two, and that is because. Again, someone went, went and, and named it the endowment effect. So people just don't want to lose something that they consider it's theirs. So the fact of having a, 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 ca a voucher, a cash voucher in their hand physically, and that's why they have they wanted to mail uh, people um, and not just sending an email or something. The fact that they w that's the re the reason is because they wanted to play on the endowment effect. So they. Uh, that f f sort of plays with consumer psychology principles, and and actually the experiment confirmed that that's a more successful strategy than sending any sort of indiscriminate um, uh, invitation to come back. <coughs> so uh, this this all really goes uh, boils down to um, an invitation, I guess, to um, think about what your pricing, what your what your prices could be. Think about what your discounting should be if you, if you want to offer any, but at the same time be sort of creative and think outside the box in terms of how you present this this uh, this strategy to uh, to your to your customers because um, the experiments such as this one show that if you um, put a bit of thinking and think and think creatively in terms of uh, how you present it to customers that yields uh, quite positive results. I think that leads me to talk about um, revenue management. As I spoke about um, revenue management before, these are a uh, favorite um, de definition of revenue management. I uh, can read it out loud. Uh, revenue management ensures that companies will sell the right product to the right customer at the right time for the right price. So, uh, <laughs> easier said than done. Um, clearly, that's, that's quite difficult to achieve. Uh, but there are um, there there are ways to, to do that. Um, revenue management is something that has been around for for a long time. Um, I think it, it, Robert Cross specifically was um, one of the pioneers, and he used revenue management. He actually uh, sort of uh, worked on the on the theory of revenue management when um, uh, and applied it to the airline industry in the in the seventies, um, and. I think uh, this is better explained by uh, another example um, with our uh, minor entertainment friends and in their in the, uh, the, the other show. Um, this is a way of, this is a display of revenue management in operation. So that one on the picture on the right is, um, 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 I know, maybe it was a wrong choice of image because it's EasyJet and I know EasyJet is quite popular. But, um, what these what uh, what these two pictures show is that, as I said before, you you are make by presenting prices, admission prices in this in uh, or uh, airline prices in this in this case, by presenting them uh, in a way that it's easier it's easier for the customer to make trade offs, more explicitly that that's a revenue management technique. So if you are charging different prices, and we we said that's in that there's a benefit to doing that. You want. You also need to make sure that the trade, the trade-off, that the difference is is clear and explicit to customers. So, in fact, um, I think in the EasyJet example, it, you can see clearly how much the, um, how much the, 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 how big the range of prices is, and they play a lot on that. And uh, I think everyone has mixed feelings about whether they should be doing that or not. 
but in terms of uh, um, really didn't want to focus on the actual amounts but so much as the uh, the technique used to um, highlight the lowest fare highlight um, the the feature of each offer but by making as with the examples have that we um, that we said before by ma by making these um, uh, the, the prices in uh, these offers in, in any way uh, by, make, by making them comparable really easily for customers that um, that helps them make a decision and potentially um, hopefully um, s s just drive some demand out of peak time which is something that um, with weather dependent um, attractions that I'm sure that could really help so um, in terms of, as I said, in terms of uh, bringing demand outside of peak times and sort of shifting it to uh, to sort of um, uh, slots with lower demand, the data. This is an example that we see very very often, and uh, it apply. The principle applies clearly. The, the numbers are a bit um, um, adjusted to for the purposes of the example, but what what these organisations is doing really is you can see the prices, uh, the, the sales, which is the height of the, col the red column for each day of the week. And you can see already that they are charging a different price. So for Saturday, they're charging £20 per unit. Um, and for the weekdays, they're charging less. So that's already um, you know, sig telling people, if you want to save, there are ways to save. If you want to pay less, uh, there you can come on a, attend on a Monday, Tuesday, and so on. However, you still see, as we often see, in, uh, that the weekend uh, is just has stronger demand uh, because people are free and they can travel more. So, despite charging a uh, higher price for Saturday, the demand is still stronger on Saturday sales and more tickets. So, the if this organization charged twenty five pounds for Saturday, it is still a higher price, but now the difference between 15 and 25 is bigger. It's something that plays on the, on the concept of, of, of thresholds. So now it's a 10 pound difference. So if someone is making a, a purchasing decision and thinks, well, this is, you know, for a family of four, it's, it's, it's a considerable amount of money that I'm saving. But the, the, the gap now is, is big enough that it's, um, it might encourage people to, uh, to change the, their uh, attendance from a peak time where you um, have little capacity available to a weekday, for example, where you have lots of capacity available. So hopefully that will do that, and that give, that basically generates more money in two ways. One, because you um, drive uh, income and sales into the more what we call distressed inventory or weaker in or days with this weaker demand, but at the same time, crucially, you are freeing up space, freeing up capacity. Uh, for the uh, for you for the time where you're, there's there's higher demand, and that means that also charging that high, higher price generates more sales and generates uh, more income. So in in when whenever this really works in terms of um, for organizations that have uh, limited capacity, uh, that's 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 uh, sort of self evident. For also for organizations or attractions that don't have a fixed limited capacity. I think it works also in terms of, for example, uh, reducing the you know the time that you spend queuing up for an attraction or um, uh, the, the the congestion at the at the bar or things like that. So it's not necessarily just about the uh, your capacity in a hotel. It's also about the experience that customers have at, uh, in the in any of the different um, time slots. So having talked about. Um, uh, admission and accommodation in a way, I wanted to turn briefly to affiliation. So affiliation is what we, um, we it's, it's an umbrella term to include uh, things like memberships and passes and donations. So anything that uh, brings customers to affiliate with your organization, your, your service. Um, I wanted to bring the example of the work we've done with Compton Verney. So Compton Verney um, is uh, it, this is a case study we've done uh, with them? Uh, you might know it's a, it's an attraction in uh, Warwickshire. They have a house, gardens, exhibition spaces, restaurant, and and landscape, landscape gardens, and so on, and a bit more. So, in terms of the affiliation for Compton Burnie, uh, they have they had a membership uh, offer. So, as many uh, um, attractions have, uh, they you pay um, an annual fee and you get certain benefits. 
uh, so you get unlimited entry for in in, this, in their case uh, entry to permanent collections and grounds uh, unlimited free entry to exhibitions your uh, e special e bulletin and uh, priority booking and discounts for special events so in addition to that they also had yes they also had uh, higher philanthropic uh, offers so if you wanted to uh, donate a bit more um, you, the donations, um, philanthropic donations started at 250 pounds and you get a certain number of, of benefits with that. So if uh, you, if you sort of, uh, if, if we accept what we said before that it's inherently beneficial to have different prices for people to choose from, that you can already see where, sort of where I'm going with this. But before getting there, I wanted to mention um, how, how we got there and how, what, what, how we approach the 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 challenge because clearly uh, Compton Bernie uh, staff have been doing that for a long time and they were um, they they were successful at what they did so it, in terms of um, us uh, going to them and say this is what you should do I don't think that really works that way because and if you if you're running your business or your attraction or your organization you probably know very much uh, very well how to run it because you've done it for a long time but at the same time having this sort of an external eye um, uh, helping with that was quite beneficial to them and and we also what we did was we used this um, quite sophisticated research technique which is called conjoint analysis conjoint research if anyone's familiar with that what what conjoint does is it um, allows you to uh, to test the value of benefits certain benefits in a package um, uh, on perspective or existing members and it, it allows you to sort of rank the, the benefits. So what do people really want to see in the package? And crucially, how much they're willing to pay for that. It's, not, it's completely different to asking people, how much would you pay for a limited entry, come to Bernie on a Saturday, on a weekend in summer? It's not that, because as we know, people are really bad at assessing uh, things in isolation. And it's really difficult for any of us to say, how much would you pay, would you pay for hotel stay in, in Douglas? Clearly, the answer is uh, it, it depends. It depends on when I'm going, where I'm going, I'm going with someone or not. Um, we used yes. These are these are the list of benefits that we wanted to um, to test with a conjoint analysis for Compton Burning. So some of the um, of the benefits. So the benefits will be uh, ticket discounts or restaurant reservations, uh, uh, priority uh, out of our access, guest passes, priority booking, and so on. So clearly some of them were uh, binary, so uh, out of our access, included, not included. Some, of, uh, some others were more so new ones, so there were different levels of, um, of benefits, so for example, discount. And so we put that to the test. Um, and this is, a, yes, this is a sort of simplified version of the results. So what the bars, the blue bars would show is the uh, elasticity of demand, so the propensity uh, uh, or, you know, for demand to change had that benefit being included in the in the package. So as you can see, some of them by the as you can see by the length of the bar, some of some benefits were not really um, there was there was not a strong preference uh, about them. So for example, out of our access out of our access could go either way. People weren't really um, there wasn't any statistical significant, statistically significant difference in whether people wanted that in or not. But things such as uh, discounts, that, that, that's a benefit that clearly, uh, uh, the propensity to, to, to purchase, the demand would change significantly had that benefit been included. Um, so um, once you have these results, the way to put them in practice, the way that they put it in practice was to use those those sort of combinations of benefits to segment their audience. And um, this morning we've seen uh, a, a, a sort of a similar example of, of audience profiling, audience segmentation. So that helps sort of um, identify meaningful clusters of individuals. Then and then you can choose your target, your your marketing activity, or your affiliation uh, strategy differently depending on which profile you're talking to. So the f the results for Compton Bernie, uh, the results from the conjoint allow them to segment their audience in a way that um, based on their price sensitivity or based on their preferred benefit. So that means that they could use those responses to identify um, s segments and clusters in their in their audience, and they could choose whichever um, they can allocate their resources more efficiently. Um, 
the results eventually, uh, after all this analysis, you want to put that into practice. And uh, um, we had predicted, so this is what they had before. So this is a 30 pound offering with uh, the benefits. So I'm not going to uh, pretend like you will read all the numbers, but uh, at this point, 56% um, of if if in, in if this was the choice for uh, prospective ca customers, the te the research showed that fifty six percent of the customers would purchase this um, this package, whereas with the new uh, formulation we came up with two packages. So that's consistent with offering different prices for people to choose from. So the price difference between the silver offer and the gold offer is not is not massive. One is twenty eight, one is thirty two pounds. The range of benefits clearly is changes, so th that those are value fences. So that means that to justify having to spend an extra a few pounds to get a gold membership, you, you, you need to give people a reason to, to, to do that. So um, clearly the number of benefits were um, allocated differently. And that, what that resulted in uh, is actually a quite consistent um, uh, share of, um, of uh, members that then went on to purchase it. So that's what we predicted, and in fact, that was quite very similar to what they've seen in the, in the next season, where membership had gone up by 18%, and I think it was 21% um, was the uptake for silver, and I think it was something around 60% was uh, the uptake for, um, for gold. So that was a quite um, interesting project. Uh, the, the research that's involved is quite, is quite um, complex, but um, having that, uh, one of the most important aspects of, of my daily work and our job in general is to provide that sort of evidence. And in that, in that way, I think it's, more, it's easier for, um, for stakeholders in the industry to then go to their uh, to funding bodies or to, um, uh, to sort of add, to pitch their, um, their organization or their service. And if you have evidence that backs up your, your, um, your pitch, that's, that's always good. Um, uh, this is what they presented eventually in their brochure. So one key thing, so they presented the, the gold and silver membership and then all the other um, uh, offers. One thing that I wanted to mention about this that I think we can also pick up in for uh, some of you will be at the workshop this afternoon um, is that they start, always start, that sounds weird, but always start with the thing that you want people to do. So you want people to buy the most expensive one you want people to buy the gold membership, you want, you want them to get benefits and you want to get a bit more money, present that first. Because people are, um, when they assess uh, a page like this, I'm sure there are multiple studies and multiple research that say we are primed to see, to, to sort of being influenced by the first thing that we see on the page. And there'll be a lot more about that in the workshop this afternoon. Um, so in terms of, uh, I talked about affiliation, we talked about um, admission prices, but and there are all, the, all sorts of dimensions to that. I haven't talked about ancillary sales, but that's crucially, uh, and this, all these elements or these dimensions are all interconnected in your pricing strategy. So really, uh, an integrated earned income strategy needs to take into account all of these different aspects. So it's not just about um, I put prices down or I put prices up, I've increased my discounting, is what is the value of the different dimensions that you're offering uh, and how that's come across to customers. Um, so in, in, in addition to that, of course, there's, a, there's an aspect that I'm sure everyone is, is aware of and we, it has been mentioned today. It's about communicating the value. So clearly prices and discounts can help you, um, can help customers make decisions, but if you do not um, communicate the value of your organization of your um, attraction, your service, it's the, regardless of the price, people find it quite difficult to, to sort of to engage. Um, so in terms of takeaways, oh, I haven't checked the time. Oh, I'm a bit late, sorry. I'm, I'm wrapping up. Um, sorry, I'm keeping you from lunch. In terms of key takeaways, if you had to, to, to really have some bullet points to take away from this discussion, uh, and hopefully actually to have more um, uh, happy to take questions or to discuss over lunch or the workshop. The key to maximizing sales and income is getting your price differentiation right. More prices for people to choose from. Uh, there are different, there are many different value fences and, and multiple ways to justify differences in price. You want to have that right. 
uh, for many attractions and organizations, there's a potential to multiply the impact through the application of revenue management techniques. Not, not, not everything will work for everyone, but there are this, this range of tools and techniques. Uh, bear in mind consumer psychology when presenting your offers and think outside the box when it comes to leveraging affiliation. So it's not just about that one-time purchase, it's about how uh, the customer feels in terms of engagement with, with you. And in terms of er, in, earned income strategy, that's unique to each organization. So what are your AAA admission, affiliation, ancillary sales opportunities? And finally, don't forget the value of comparison. Thank you. <laughs>